Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Assalam. Welcome, welcome. Hope everyone is doing well. Mashallah, we see uh, the familiar names coming back. I know some people are quieter. They don't. They're not. They don't comment and stuff. But we see some. Uh, I, I know for sure some people who are here. Alaikum <laughs> salam wa rahmatullah. Hope everyone is salam. More familiar names, mashallah, mashallah. We'll give it inshallah a minute, let people on. Anyone like we normally have been doing, if anyone has any questions, anything that they would like to ask, maybe about something from class yesterday, about um, Allah Hayik Khartum, Alaikum Salam, Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Salam, Rahmatullah. If anyone would like to share any reflections so far about, uh, you know, some of the themes of the surah, some of the things that we've discussed, we're continuing, inshallah, today, uh, just with the backdrop, uh, talking about the Battle of Al-Ahzab, because like we said, it's one of the main points in this surah. So just to kind of give that background, Jamil, very good question. So we have a couple of questions. If um, if we can share the screen too, please. Okay, so uh, let's address some of these questions. Dr. Wahid, always good to hear from you, mashallah. Uh, if even, so, so the question is, even though the shaitan is chained in Ramadan, why do we still have distractions at times <coughs> during our salah? So this is an interesting issue, the issue of uh, the shayateen being locked up. Uh, so there's a difference of opinion on which shayateen are locked up, if all the shayateen are locked up, um, if it's not all, if it's just some who, who are the ones that are, are locked up. If we take the opinion that all of the shayateen are locked up, that all of them are locked up, um, and we say, and we, and then we say, okay, so why are, why do we still have distractions in the salah? That is from ourselves. That's from ourselves, from our own uh, nafs, from our own kind of, you know, just inability to focus, which again is sometimes a, a very natural thing but also sometimes uh, something that, you know, we always we, we obviously have to work on, you know. Uh, so so that's, that's why. It's like, why do we still sin? Why do we still sin? It's because the nafs, 
the nafs, right? And, and the way that it was explained uh, to me by someone a long time ago, and I still remember it was very, very good kind of analogy. It's like if you have a cup of coffee, right, or chai, and you put in some sugar or something, and then you, you, you mix it with a spoon, and you have that little spoon in there, and you mixed it, and when you pull out that spoon, uh, if you've mixed it, you know, just enough, or if, you, if, you're, if you've been mixing it fast enough, and you pull out that spoon, that tea or that coffee is still, there's still the impact of that spoon. You still see it kind of swirling, right? And so similarly, the, the, the impact of the shaitan on our nafs, it still, it still can, you know, extend into Ramadan. It still can extend into Ramadan. It's just we're the carriers of that. And so that's kind of the battle in Ramadan is to, is to fight that, uh, those, those whispers, to fight those distractions, these kind of things. Then there's a, the other opinion that it's not all of the shayateen who are locked up. It's only the big shayateen who are locked up. And the shayateen that, that, you know, the qareen, for example, that we have, like that each person has with them, that that's still with them. That's, that's still with them and that's not uh, locked up per se. And so it could be from that as well, if you take that opinion. And Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Could we explain the three groups of al -Ahza? So, um, if you mean within the Ahzab, you have Quraysh, you have Ghatafan, you have Banu Asad, and Banu Sulaym, and then the Jews. The Jews, but the main, like the actual Ahzab who are coming from the, you know, from outside to attack Medina are some of those tribes. Uh, mainly the two biggest ones are uh, Quraysh and Ghatafan. Quraysh and Ghatafan. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Uh, Quraysh and Ghatafan. And then you have, again, some smaller tribes that were there with them. And so that's uh, who the Ahzab you know, as, as a whole are. As a whole are. Jazakumullah khair. Three questions, mashallah. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khairi khalqillah. Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man wala. Allahumma laka alhamd kama yanbaghi li jalali wajhik wa li azimi sultanik. La nuhsi thana'an alayk anta kama athnayta ala nafsik. Hadikum Allah sahibah lakum. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين. So الحمد لله we're continuing. This is the end of our second week. You know, Subhanallah, we are basically already there at the halfway point of Ramadan and, and in essence at the halfway point of our class after today's class, inshallah. Um, and it is going by very quickly. It is going by very quickly. May Allah allow us to benefit from what remains and accept from us what has passed. So we had stopped discussing, you know, when we were discussing some of the difficulties in the battle of, uh, or the condition of the Muslims in the battle of Al-Ahzab. And um, just to kind of give that backdrop to see how, how, like this is not just, you know, oh, they had, you know, like that one of those huge, I don't know if you've ever seen that, how, how, like how they make tunnels, one of those machines, and then they just dug a trench and they're good. Right? There's a lot of effort, there's a lot of work, and then at a time also when there's not a lot of resources materially, you know, not a lot of food, not a lot of, you know, um, not, not a lot to kind of sustain them throughout this process physically. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sustaining them spiritually so this is where we see glad tidings being given to give them hope to replace that fear that's where you have uh you know uh, the story inshallah that we're going to mention now you know uh, divine these divine miracles this divine aid divine sustenance that's coming to replace that hunger right so it, it shows us that in those moments of difficulty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings a sense and a sort of ease as well Sister Iram is saying, but she is not uh, the Prophet Muhammad mentioned that devil Khinzib is this yes. So, so that that's the devil, that's the shaitan who's uh, assigned to make us mess up in prayer, Khinzib. And that and that's 
you know, that's that's going to be something. So let's say, for example, that Khinzib is locked up. He's from, he's from the shayatin that are locked up. Still, the impact of it in our own nafs, our own shaitan, our own qareen, or just ourselves, you know, having uh, a lack of focus, that still could be the, the reason or the cause. But maybe this additional, uh, this additional, you know, influence is not there. This additional influence is not there. Allah knows best. Alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mr. Abdul Ghani. Jibreel. Okay. So I want to show. So this is, I want to show the, the, the dimensions in a way that maybe we can uh, relate to. Or just so you see things and, see, and understand uh, how that trench you know, basically how deep it was. Okay. So, uh, so like, so like we said, so these are some of the numbers that we got from some of our Mashaikh, uh, some of the scholars. So if you see that little guy there, it's kind of hard to see He's standing in front of this, you know, trailer container thing. The trailer container thing is, is, is a representation of the width and then the, the heights of the trench. So the depth, about five and a half meters, i.e. about around 18 feet. The width, about six meters, about 20 feet. That's a, that's a guy there, okay? It's a car, it's a plane, small plane. And then the length also, but you can't see the full length because it would be difficult to see. Uh, scaling it here, 2,700 meters, 2,700 meters, okay? So let's kind of just have it here so we see how things are. Okay. All right. So let's see if there's any. <coughs> okay. So um, this was a time, like we said, even of, of hunger. So there was not a lot of food. So some of the narrations they mention that what they would be trying to eat or find some of these Sahaba is that they would have something, you know, basically whatever they could find, they would eat. And so the narrations, they mentioned that, you know, one of the foods that was being eaten at this time was just like you take a small amount of wheat, right? And mixed with, with semen, with like uh, fat. So it becomes like a, you know, a more solid, you know, you mix it to, to make it almost like, a, you know, something that has shape, has body, and you would eat that. But the narrations mentioned that the fat would be so old that it actually had a, you know, you know, when meat gets like a little bit old, that it changed the taste and the smell, right? And even sometimes this, they couldn't find it. So you're talking about like just eating whatever is available, whatever is there. Something that if we had seen, we'd throw away right away, right? And so sometimes even this, they, they're, they're, they're looking for this to even eat. And so they ate dates instead. Sometimes they couldn't even find dates. One of the companions mentioned that we went three days without even eating. And they're, and they're working too. They're not even sitting at home and saying, man, there's nothing to eat, which is difficult in and of itself. Right, so three days without eating, and the Prophet sallallahu was also with them in that. Like he wasn't, uh, you know, he didn't have like his store of food, like his amount of food, and everyone else is going hungry. Right? No, in fact, in the Hadith of Jabir radiAllahu an, one of the most beautiful stories I think in the Sirah. Um, so Jabir he says, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And his and his stomach, he says, is uh, basically his stomach was like almost like shriveled up in a way. You know, it's just you could see the impact of the hunger physically on him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to the point that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had rocks, you know, tied around his uh, his stomach. You know, they would do this, and I think you know you may have heard this before that when they were very hungry. They would actually tie rocks 
around you know their stomach like a, like a belt that I would have first they, they would tie a belt and that would kind of like almost like trick the 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 body into thinking that the stomach is full because you're pressing down on the stomach and then if that wasn't enough then they would actually have the uh have it tied with rocks to push down even further so Jabir mentions that he saw the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with with two rocks and he's like i can't uh he, he, it was it was a very difficult sight for him to see the Prophet him in this condition. And so he says, so he went to his wife and he asked, is there anything? Do we have anything to be able to to, to host the Prophet wasallam? And and his wife said, all we have is like a small amount of saq of which is like four handfuls of sha'ir of like wheat and a small just a small animal. Just a little bit. So <coughs> Jabir says, okay, that's good enough, inshallah. So he says, basically, uh, he, he slaughtered the animal and he had his wife prepare the sha'ir, uh, the wheat, and they made it into like, uh, they were going to make it into like a small stew. And so he tells, his, uh, his wife tells him, his wife tells him, don't embarrass me with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and who's with him. Meaning, like invite the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Maybe one, maybe two people. Maybe Abu Bakr and Umar. Maybe, but don't invite more people than we have food for, right? And then you see that and that interaction there is also very, very beautiful, right? So then Jabir he goes back to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he whispers to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He tells him, you know that you know that I'm inviting you and and a few. Uh, just maybe, you know, maybe Abu Bakr, maybe Umar, maybe a few of the companions to basically come and, and there's some food. My wife, she made some food. I have some, we, we slaughtered this little animal, right? And so then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after Jabir whispers it to him, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he announces to the whole army, he says, Jabir, he has made a meal for all of you. Yeah, he's invited all of you to come, basically, right? And so Jabir, you can imagine, like Jabir in this moment, you know, one of the things that can be the most embarrassing for a host, you know, even in our events that we have, you know, when we have guests coming over, especially but in our households or our families, is if you invite someone over and there's not enough food for them, right? Like you, the, the things run out, whether it's at an iftar or, and that's why usually we go to the opposite side. We make sure that there's going to be enough for dates. You know, but because if 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 it if if we run out of food in front of someone, it's it's very it's a, it's not a it's not a good look, right? To us, it's the same thing here for Jabir. Jabir is like, what's going on, right? And so, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he sees that like worry in in the face of Jabir, so he tells him he says, look, don't make your bread like have it prepared, but don't actually make it, or don't take off your stew from you know, from it being prepared from it cooking until I come. Until I come. This is what he tells him. Just don't worry about it. Just don't do this until I come. And so Jabir, he went back to his wife and he told her what happened. And he told her basically the entire army is going to be eating. And she got upset with him. The narration mentions that, yani, bika wa bika, like she's, she's, you know, you can imagine. <laughs> she told him, don't go and embarrass me. And that's exactly what she feels like he did. Right? Even though it wasn't his fault, and uh, and he say he tells us, oh, he says, look, I did what you asked me to do, right? I did what I did what you asked me to do, uh, and he says, Jabir, he says in the narration, he says, uh, he says, I I got embarrassed. He says, Haya an la ya'lamuha illallah. Now, an embarrassment only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows. Like out of out of just like what's gonna happen out of worry out of embarrassment. And then, so his wife in this moment is beautiful. She says, did the Prophet, so she, she kind of like settles down a little bit and she says, did the Prophet wasallam ask you about the food? And did, did you tell him like how much and, and, and these things? And, and he says, yes. And he still said, you know, that this is how it was going to be. And he said, yes. He said, then Allah and his messenger wasallam know best. Right? You see that, that strength of Iman in this, in this woman and these companions, radiallahu anhu. Like if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he said it, it's fine. That means it's going to be taken care of. In what, in what way? We don't know, but it'll be taken care of. And so Jabir, he said, so some of my fear went away and I told her, you're right. Sadaqti. 
right? And this is again, yeah, you see the subhanAllah, the, the benefit here of, of, of a relationship in which they remind themselves of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, <coughs> so then, um, so then, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam comes with with the companions, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he uh, he comes to you know the bread being made in the pot that has the stew in it, and he put his saliva sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the bread, right, a, a, a light amount, and this is from his barakah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he, uh, and then he, he, and, and in the pot as well, and then he made dua for the food, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told Jabir that he would bake the bread with them. Basically, he's preparing the bread with them. And that, uh, or sorry, that, that Jabir, so you, he says, Jabir, you bake the bread, and she would bake as well. And then his wife would take from the stew and mix it with the bread. Okay, so they're they're now Prophet Sallallahu is kind of like, you know, directing the, this food being made, and so now that you have this stew that you can imagine, how much stew can you make from a, a saw of wheat and um, and a little animal? Okay, and so uh, Jabir he said that they were one thousand, and I swear by Allah that they ate until they left. I and mean, they left out of being full. Not that they got embarrassed, so they ate a little bit and then they left. No, they left out of being full. And he says, and the pot was full like it was, and the dough was still there ready to be baked. Yeah, I and mean, basically nothing decreased. Nothing decreased. The pot was still brimming. And he says, and, and this was, you know, this is the barakah of, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you see again in the, in this moment of difficulty, you see Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's aid and his help coming through, and you see this one of these miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. So that's just a, a, a nice story that's mentioned there. So what happened is, like we said, the trench is dug in front of the Jebel, uh, the, the mountain of Salah. It's a natural protection from uh, their back. And the Prophet ﷺ, he put the woman and the children in these husun, these almost like these, these uh, fortresses. Let me show you what these look like. So this is actually still one that is there. This is an example of a husn uh, of these fortresses. And so this is where they would put, you know, as, as protection, they would put their, their uh, you know, the woman folk, the children. Okay. What happens at this time? Banu Quraida, who's in agreement with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? Who have they have a treaty, and they're and they're protecting again the backside. Yeah, they're protecting that backside of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They betray their agreements. They they betray their their agreement. So now the Muslims, even though they have the trench here, okay, as you can see, that's in front. That's protecting them from that that exposed side. Now, though, the problem is behind them. They are ex they 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 are exposed. They are exposed. What do I mean by they're exposed? Meaning that there's betrayal from within the city now as well, because Banu Quraida is inside the city. So they are <clears throat> they 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 are exposed. They're exposed, and they, they basically. It's almost like they're sandwiched in. It's almost like they're sandwiched in. And so now that adds to the fear, that adds to that adds to the worry. Okay? What happened? 
one of the, the Jews of Banu Nadir, Huyay ibn Akhtab, we mentioned his name yesterday. And he's actually, this is the father of, who becomes eventually the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Safiya, Safiya bin Huyay. So he goes to, to Ka'b ibn Sa'd. And he was the one who had made the agreement with the Muslims on behalf of Quraydah. And basically he goes to him. And initially when Huyay goes to him, Ka'b, he doesn't want anything to do with him. He says, just leave me alone. You're only bringing evil. We have an agreement. We're not going to break that agreement. But he continues to kind of push. Huyay continues to push, continues to push until he finally breaks Ka'b and he, and he finally breaks, uh, you know, Quraydah and convinces them to betray the Prophet ﷺ by telling them, look, that I've come to you, that Quraysh is coming, and it has all of its leaders and its strengths and its power. Ghatafan is coming with all of its leaders and its strength and its power. Basically, he's like, I've come to you with an ocean that no one can stand in its path. And so he finally convinces, uh, he, he finally convinces him to, and that they announce the breaking of the treaty. So Quraida announces the breaking of the treaty and this news reaches the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent Mu'ad, uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, Khawat ibn Jubair, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, the leaders of the Ansar, the people who knew Ben Quraida best. He sends them to go see if it's true. So when they got there, when these companions got there, the, the, the people of Quraida, they cursed them and they told them they broke the treaty. And they insulted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on top of that. It's no treaty, right? And they have their, you know, fortresses and stuff as well. They're, uh, you know, they, they are protected behind these walls. And so what, what happens now, this increases the fear for their families. Because Quraidah is there within the vicinity to be able to, 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 to harm them from within. So the, now the families are exposed, the families, the women, the children are at risk. And we're going to see this ayah being reflected in Surah Al-Ahzab, okay, that we're coming to inshallah. So when the Prophet wasallam, when he saw the strength of the enemy and the weakness of, uh, you know, like basically he wanted, to, he wanted to break this appearance of strength and he wanted to give the Muslims confidence and strength. So uh, what happened? What happened? One of the leaders of Ghatafan wanted to take advantage of this situation. Remember, they're coming into this to fight as allies of Quraysh, but they're, they have an economic interest in it. They're not like, it's not like a personal problem with the Muslims like, like Quraysh had. So one of the leaders of Ghatafan, he comes, his name is Al-Halat Al-Ghatafani, he comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he asks, he says basically, he says, look, if you give us half of the yield of the dates of Medina, then we'll go back. We won't fight against you. We won't join this army that's coming against you, right? And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, not until... He, he, he basically, he listens to this offer and he says, no, I'm not going to decide anything until we talk to, until I talk to the Saud. Who are the Saud? The, uh, the people named Sa'ad, right? This is, uh, again, the leaders of the Ansar here. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah, Sa'ad ibn Khaythama, Sa'ad ibn Mas'ud. You have these, they call them as Saud, right? And so, uh, the Prophet وسلم, he goes to them and he tells them, look, the Arabs are gathering against you. Right? That this and, and they know this, right? And this uh, Ghatafani, Al Harith al Ghatafani, he's asking to take half the yield. Saying, if you give us half your yield, we won't, we won't, we won't fight you. And so Sa'ad uh radiallahu an, one of the one of the Saud, he says, if this is Wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want you to listen to what he says. It's very, very powerful. And it shows the izza, even in time of fear, the izza of the Muslims here, right? The, the honor, the nobility. So he says, if this is wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we submit to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If this is, if, if you're telling us this and that this is what you've been commanded to do as wahi, then we submit. Sami'na wa al how he said, if this is from your opinion, 
in what you want to do, telling the Prophet وسلم, then we'll follow your opinion and we'll follow what you want to do. Right? So even if it's not wahi, but it's something that you want to do, we follow you. Right? But he th then he says, but if you're trying to protect us or you want our opinion, he says, then we have our opinion, which is that we used to be equals with them in Jahiliyyah. In the times pr before Islam, we were equals with them because they know them. Right? I mean, these are these are people that they're that they uh, have done business with and these kind of things. So he says we used to be equals equal with them, right? Sawasia. He says, Wallahi, they wouldn't desire, they wouldn't dream about taking a date from us from uh, the dates of Medina, except that we would trade with them or that we or that they would buy it from us. And except that it was a barter, or except that they're buying it from us. Right? They would never dream. To actually come and, and say we, we're going to take half of your dates, right? they would ne never. Now, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has blessed us with Islam, are we going to just give up our dates like that for them? He says, "Wallahi, they're not going to touch a date, except if in the ways that they used to touch it before, and except if they want to buy, except if they want to trade. But for us to give to them, never, never. Half our dates, absolutely not." Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he turns to Hadith. Right, Al Ghatafani, this one who had come and made that offer, and he said, Huwa tha. That's what it is. There you go, basically. You heard what they said. And so Al Hadith, he got upset and he turns to the Prophet وسلم, and he says, Ghadart, you've betrayed. Right? And there was uh, one of the, the companions, there, Hassan, Hassan ibn Thabit, the, the, the poet of the Prophet, وسلم, the defender of the Prophet. وسلم, and he and he said some lines, you know, uh, 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 to Hadith defending the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam never betrays and has never betrayed. Rather, it's you and your people and people like you who betray, and it's from your, it's from what you're known for, from your habits." That was the end of that. And so you see, the Muslims are still, even though again, that would be an offer that you would think, okay, that actually sounds pretty good, right? Like. Half of our half of the yield, but we protect our. You know, we remove a bunch, a big part of this army. But the Muslims, they had this, you know, this uh, this izza that they weren't going to give up something out of fear, out of fear or out of numbers, right? And so the Muslims, they they they. Uh, this is what the situation is. They have the trench. There's not really any fighting that happens on a large scale in this battle, even though it's called a battle, right? Because of the trench, because of the trench. And so you have like small pockets of fighting here and there where the trench was not as wide, okay? And there's some stories of that, which I'm, I won't, you know, go into too much detail or I won't go into because, you know, I don't want to, uh, these are things that you can go to in reference to uh, Ali radiallahu an fighting one of the, you know, the, the, the biggest, you know, uh, the biggest, bravest, strongest people of Quraysh. He was very, you know, very brave, very strong. Uh, Ali radiallahu an fighting him. And, and basically, you know, you see the strength and the, the you know, the, who Ali radiallahu an is. Sorry, one second. Let me just remove this. Okay, so <coughs> uh, so those are there's there's some examples of that in this battle as well, and then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and this is again what we're going to see emphasized and what we're going to see really shine through in the uh, the the story or in the surah, I should say, sorry, is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's aid of the believers and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how he gave them victory in this battle right through a very uh, unexpected way and without them having to lift their swords really and without them having to uh, you know engage in much battle at all with an army of 10,000 subhanallah and that they're able to you know get through this in, in such an amazing way 
and and how Allah sets the stages for this to happen. You know, so for example, there was uh, a man by the name of Nuaim ibn Mas'ud who was from Ghatafan, from one of these tribes that's going to come uh, as part of the Ahzab. So he actually accepts Islam, but people didn't know. His people didn't know. And so he comes secretly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told him, look, I accepted Islam, so, so tell me to do whatever I can do to help. And so he tells, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells him, he's like, look, you're one man, right? So do whatever you can in your capacity to help us. And if that means even you have to, you know, engage in deception, that's fine because al-harb khuda, war is a form of deception. Okay, and so what he does, very smart, what he does is he goes to Banu Quraidah and he was close with them in Jahiliyyah before Islam. And he tells them, he says, look, you declared war against the Prophet ﷺ. If Quraysh finds an opportunity to come, they will take it. But if they don't, then they don't really lose. They go back home and you're going to be left with your betrayal in front of the Prophet ﷺ. And Banu Quraidah now they realize like, oh shoot, that's true. Like the Quraysh may leave us high and dry and, 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 and we betrayed the Prophet So they asked, they said, what should we do? Right? They trust this guy. He says, don't fight with them. And don't fight on behalf, like on the side of Quraysh until they give you collateral. Until they give you people. So that you know that they're, they're not going to abandon those people from them, that they're going to have to fight. So they said, you know what, that's a good idea. Then at the same time, Nu'aym, he goes to Quraysh, some of the leaders of Quraysh, and he tells them, and they, he's a fani, so there's a, they're allies, right? He says, look, you know my sincerity to you, okay? I was just with Quraydah. I know, they regret their betrayal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they want to make up for it. So what they're going to do is they want to take collateral, they want to take people from you, and they want to give it to the Prophet ﷺ, give those people to the Prophet ﷺ as a peace offering. And then they want to fight you with the Prophet ﷺ. So he tells them, so if they ask for anything, if they ask for collateral, don't give it to them. Don't give it to them. So he pits both sides against each other, right? And so what happens is, Quraysh, they, they, they send to, to Banu Quraydah, they say, look, we're in a place, this is when Quraysh has arrived, they're outside. Okay? We're in a place that we're not used to, and we're losing supplies, so let's attack. Okay, so they're, they're trying to get Quraydah to, to attack and to make this, you know, to make this go. Quraydah said, look, we're not going to, they, they're taking the advice of Nuaim, he said, we're not going to support you until you give us collateral. Right? Give us some of your people. So when Quraysh hears this, when, when, the, when the Quraysh hear this from, from the, the leaders of Banu Quraida, they said, oh man. They said, Nu'aym was telling us the truth. Right? They are, they are, they're going to betray us. And so they said, we're not going to give you anything. No, wait. We're not giving you collateral. You, you agreed to fight on behalf, yani, with us. You have to. And then so Quraida now says, they're not giving collateral. So Banu Quraid is like, man, Nu'aym was telling the truth. They don't actually want to fight. They're not really invested in this fight. We're in trouble, right? And so that breaks that strong alliance between the Jews inside and between the Mushrikeen outside, right? And so you're already kind of having, you know, uh, you know, uh, disputes and disunity within the ranks. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends another of his soldiers that's mentioned in the surah as well. Right? And that is a strong wind and in a dark and cold night. And this wind kept going. And this wind was so intense that it started to upturn the tents of the mushrikeen. And it put out their fires. And it flipped their pots. So all their supplies are starting to dwindle and it's cold. And this wind is not allowing them to have any sort of stability or be settled at all. And Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, he describes this in, in, uh, he describes this in, his, uh, in this hadith, this situation. So he says, on the night of Ahzab, one of these nights, it was a super strong wind and it was very cold. 
And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it's cold on the believers too, right? It's cold on the believers, but they're expecting from Allah what what the uh, what Quraysh is not expecting, right? And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says, "Is there anyone who will get the news from the enemy? Any anyone who's going to go secretly to their side and 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 see what's happening in their ranks?" And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says. The person who does this to show like how difficult this mission is and and, and, and not just, you know, uh, breaking their ranks, but also in, in the cold, in the wind. It says, whoever does this, Allah will make him my companion on the day of judgment. And just to see how difficult of a moment this is, for they thought, radiallahu anhu, he says, uh, we were quiet. Not a single one of us responded. Not a single one of us responded. He said it was so cold that we would dig for ourselves holes in the ground to protect ourselves from the cold. The Prophet ﷺ calls again, no one responds. So some of the scholars, they actually comment on this and they say the reason no one responded, some, the, the, the more popular understanding is that because of the cold, because of the wind, no one wants to get up. But one of our teachers, he said something interesting. He said, he said, you could say that possibly, right? But his opinion was that uh, that this wasn't it. He said that the, the Muslims had learned their lesson from the battle of Uhud in terms of obeying the command of the Prophet ﷺ. And so no one was going to get up until they heard the command from the Prophet ﷺ. And until he specifically commanded one of them or some of them to actually go and do that. And so, and he says, the reason that we know this is because uh, when the Prophet wasallam, he told after this, he called and no one responded. When the Prophet wasallam said, Qum ya Hudayfa, that's what Hudayfa is narrating the story. He says, get up Hudayfa, go get us the news. Hudayfa said, when he said my name, I, I got up right away. And I walked, right? And and I went to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so it wasn't a matter necessarily of no one wants to do it. And that's this is how one of our teachers I said that he he explained it. But when but when they're called to do it, they don't want to you know to 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 go beyond and and to do something that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hasn't commanded them specifically to do. And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he tells Hudayfa he says uh, go to them. Get news from them, but don't do anything that's going to cause commotion or fear or a problem. And you go get information and come back. Don't stir up any any problem. And so, uh, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent him, he says, "So I walked, and it was like I was walking through a hammam. Hammam, in, in their context, is like I, I felt warm, warmth in my body. Right? He's being sent on this mission by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam." And he says, I, I immediately felt, you know, like this, this warmth, like I lost that feeling of cold. And so he says, so I go and I'm able to, to get into uh, the encampment of, of the, the Ahzab, of Quraysh and, and them. And he says, and I saw Abu Sufyan and I saw him with his back towards the fire. He's warming up his back towards the fire. And he says that." I put an arrow in my bow. And then he's basically he's like, I was, I, he, he said, I, I was, you know, I put this arrow in my bow. He says, and then I remembered the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I put it back. He says, he says, if I had shot it, I would have gotten him. I would have gotten him. And there's a beautiful point and a beautiful lesson here. Imagine if he had done that, what would have happened and what that would have caused. Right? But he, 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 he remembers the words of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and so he puts it back. And as a result of that, there's no commotion, and the Muslims get that victory, right? But at the same time, imagine if he had done that. Right? Then, then, then Abu Sufyan dies on disbelief, but he doesn't. And then, as a result of that, or after that, I shouldn't say necessarily as a result, but after that, Abu Sufyan accepts Islam and becomes one of the great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It, just, it shows you know, Hudayfa making that decision to to obey the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the impact that it had. So, 
Uh, Abu Sufyan, he, so Hudayfa puts himself in the ranks. Abu Sufyan, he talks to the army and he says, look, we're getting ready to leave. Okay. Uh, and you know, there's, uh, he's, <clears throat> so he says, look, we're getting ready to leave. There's difficult conditions here that, uh, that we've been betrayed by Banu Quraida. But he says, look, look, everyone look next to you. Make sure that the person next to you is someone that you know, someone that you recognize and before we make this decision so that we don't tip our hand. And so Hudayfa, he realizes like, oh, he's like, you know, he's going to get exposed as someone who's not there. So he's like, uh, I thought quickly. And so what he does is he grabbed both people next to him and he asked them, who are you? Right. He's like, who are you? And, and they answer right away. It was, it was Muawiyah actually, again, someone who accepts Islam later, and Amr ibn As, also someone who accepts Islam later. And Hudayfa says, that quick thinking, he's like, no one, they didn't ask me who I was. right? And, and, and one of the Mashaikh he mentions here, he says, like, these were two of the smartest Arabs at that time. Two of the smartest, Muawiyah and Amr ibn As. And they didn't think to ask Hudayfa who he was. And this shows the, you know, the impact of the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the help of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala first and foremost. That, it, you know, that he was able to, to stay safe in this situation, in this position. So when he goes back to the Prophet, when Hudayfa goes back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he tells him what happened. So he tells him that basically they're preparing to leave. That's it. They've given up. Hudayfa says, so he, he, he had basically completed his mission. And then he says, when I went back, and to where I was supposed to be, that's when I got cold again and I started to shake. <laughs> and so the mission was completed and he goes back to the normal and he goes back to like everyone else. And he says, the Prophet ﷺ covered me with his cloak and I slept until morning. Until the Prophet ﷺ himself woke me up and he says, yeah, no man. You know, oh, person who sleeps a lot, basically. The Prophet ﷺ is joking with him. Uh, and, and he, sa he tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, look, they're experiencing what we're experiencing uh, in cold and wind, but we hope from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala what they don't hope for. And that's something that we see in the surah as well. So they announced their departure and, and they left. And I'm mentioning these specific parts here because we're going to come across these ayats in the surah that, that narrate this to us. And, uh, you know, this was the response. You know, this victory is the response of the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that the dua that he makes, Allahumma munzil al kitab, sari al hisab, ihzim al ahzab, Allahumma ihzimhum wa zalzilhum. You know, Allah subhanahu wa taala, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa taala, the one who sent down the book, the one who is quick to reckoning, destroy, uh, yani ihzim, yani give victory over al ahzab. Allahumma ihzimhum, O oh Allah, give us victory over them, wa zalzilhum, and shake them, O oh Allah. And this was the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu He would make dua. I want to show you where. Um, so this is, so if you look at, let's see if this picture is here. So this area that we talked about, right? The seven masajid. Let's see if I have a good picture of it. Okay. So you see, this is uh, how it looks now, seven masajid. So uh, the reason that it's called the seven mosques is because there were actually seven masajid that were built. And these were built in areas where some of the battalions were. Where some of the battalions were. And they were named, the masajid were named after the battalions, uh, the leader of those battalions. So you have, uh, I don't know if you can see my, I don't think you can see the, my arrow. But uh, if you look, you know, you see the, the, the masjid, right, in front of you. Okay, the masjid uh, al-Khandaq, or Sabah Masajid, and you see a parking lot, right, in front of that. So to the left of that parking lot, you see a little bit of an area that kind of juts out almost into the mountain, right? In that area that juts out, there's like a little building there. It looks like a little house, okay? That's called Masjid al-Fatih. That's where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was encamped. That's where his tent was. Okay, so I'll show you what that masjid looks like now. So they, they, so they actually built a little masjid here. It's small. It's not big at all. You can see it. And there's stairs that go up. And actually, it's, uh, it's a place that still people come and make dua there. And, and, and uh, I believe sometimes it, it's open. I don't know if they open it anymore. 
Okay, and then you have some of the other masajid here. So you have Masjid Abu Bakr and Masjid Umar. Okay, and and uh, until now, most of them have been removed. And these are just historical masajid. These aren't masajid that were like there at the time of Abu Bakr at the time of Umar, right? But they're historical masjid that kind of demarcate these areas where uh, where they were. Okay, you can see some of them here also. Like there, so basically they're within the parking lot. So there's one kind of in the middle of the parking lot. You can see it. It's like a little house, almost like a little blue roof. That's one of the, the, the masajid. I think most of them are not there anymore. Masjid Fatih for sure is there. And maybe Abu Bakr and Masjid Umar are there. Then there's one here, uh, you know, to the right of the parking lot. You see almost like, it's like there's like a wall, right? When the parking lot completes, there's like a wall. And then there's like this grassy area. There's one of the masajid there as well. Uh, one of the seven masajid that are there as well. So you have, uh, what are the the six? You have, uh, this was built by Umar bin Abdul Aziz, actually. So it was built, you know, in, uh, you could say almost like a, about 100 years after the Prophet So you have Masjid al-Fatih, which we showed, Masjid Salman, Abu Bakr, Umar, Ali, and Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, or uh, Masjid Fatima. There's one that's called Masjid Fatima as well. Okay. In this battle, there was uh, six, five or six shuhada, uh, and they're buried here as well. They're buried here as well. Okay, there's like this little graveyard here, <coughs> and then one of the so it's five that are buried here, and one actually that's buried in Baqir, and that's Saad ibn Mu'ad because Saad ibn Mu'ad he uh, he was martyred, he he was injured. In the battle, an arrow came from the other side and hit him. And he was injured, but he didn't pass away right away. He passed away later on. And so he passed away when they were back in Medina, back, you know, in, in, the, in you know, their homes and, and stuff. And so he he uh, was buried in Baqir. He was buried in Baqir. So a very small amount of casualties, uh, of martyrs, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them this uh, resounding victory. I mean, think about it. 10,000 <coughs> coming to destroy, wipe out the city of Medina and, and five are martyred or six are martyred. And they go back humiliated and lost after gathering this entire, these ahsab and all these plans and all these things, nothing, right? Nothing. And that shows, I mean, the, the subhanAllah, you see the, the, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shining through the response of the du'as. And the reason I mentioned Masjid Fatih specifically is because the scholars, they say that the Prophet Sallallahu he made du'a here. So was his encampment where he was, where his tent was, that the Prophet Sallallahu he made du'a here uh, multiple days. He was making du'a for victory multiple days. And his du'a was answered on uh, on a Wednesday between Dhuhr and Asr. Between Dhuhr and Asr. And so until now in Medina, uh, you find some of you know the people who know these things, that, like you know the uh, you know the certain people will go to Masjid al fatih on Wednesday after Dhuhr and go and make du'a there. Ta'asiyan bin Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, following this this uh, the way of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so Jabir actually would say that this is a one of the times uh, uh, that du'a is answered. One of the times that du'a is answered. And Allah knows best. So we, it was, maybe we should have mentioned this yesterday because yesterday was Wednesday, right? Inshallah, next one. So Wednesday between Dhuhr and Asr. And so they would go to this place here. It's this actual masjid. Like, and even if it's not open, you they would stand in front They stand in front of the door and they would make du'a there. So they combine between the time and the place. It's, uh, it's very beautiful. Uh, you know, the, the, the time, uh, Wednesdays after the Lord and then the place where the Prophet made that, made that du'a. You see some of the the righteous of Medina they do this. Okay, so that's that's why it's called seven masjid. You see, we're like this is like these are like almost like trivia questions here you know, that you can answer. Of course, much more valuable, of course, but uh, this is where the du'a of the Prophet Sallallahu was was answered. Okay, so uh, this is the victory that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He gives. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gives the believers. And this is the victory that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, uh, you know, this help, this aid, this support, uh, 
that Allah talks about in this surah that we're going to come to, inshallah. So because the surah is named Al-Ahzab, right, I wanted to, you know, this was the way of, of uh, one of one of our teachers as well, that, you know, because the surah is named Al-Ahzab, he started by speaking about the battle of, the battle of Al-Ahzab, the battle of Al-Ahzab. <coughs> And inshallah, we'll come back to these parts of the story when we and, and connect them with the ayat that we come across. The ayat that we come across. Any questions before we get into this? The, before we get into the verses, the ayat. Let's see if I have anything else I wanted to show you. So those are the, we'll take, we'll, we'll start with those four ayat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in these four ayat, the translation is with, is, O, uh, o Nabi, fear Allah and do not follow, and do not follow the instruction, sorry, do not follow the, the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Undoubtedly, Allah is ever the all-knowing, the wise. Follow what has been revealed to you from your Rabb. Allah is ever informed about what you do. Rely only on Allah. Allah is sufficient as a helper. Allah has not placed two hearts within any man's chest. <coughs> Nor has he made your wives with whom you practice dhihar your mothers. Allah has also not made your adopted sons your own sons. This is merely a statement from your lips. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks the truth and only he guides to, to the straight path. Only he guides to the straight path. So, uh, it's, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he begins Oh, looks like it froze. Is, is it fine now, inshallah? Okay, alhamdulillah, we're good. So we recited the first four ayats and we translated and we read the translation as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts this surah uh, by addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya ayyuhan nabi, O messenger. And this is uh, a nida of takreem. This is a, uh, a, a Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or addressing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with an address of honor, with an address of honor. I mentioned this to uh, to our to our aqida class, to our you know faith insight class. That a lot of times we we make this uh, you know we we say this thing that you know uh, Isa and Musa and these prophet a lot of these prophets are mentioned more times in the Quran than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam by name. Right, and and we use that, you know, as a as a form of da'wah to tell people, you know, and, then, and there's a benefit to it, of course. I'm not saying don't do it, right? But uh, you know, to show like, oh yes, we we we, uh, you know, we honor Isa, and 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 he's mentioned more times in the Quran than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it's true by name. But in terms of of addressing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that's obviously, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the one who's addressed the most. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't address the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by name. And this is not anything except uh, a, a way of honoring the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because to be addressed by the title, uh, by this specific title especially, is the greatest way to honor the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? The, to be uh, from the anbiya is the highest status that a person can have in this world, right? Uh, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he first starts with, and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, then he's with those who Allah has had his favor on from. The first one that he starts with is the nabiyin Right, so Allah addressing the Prophet ﷺ by an-Nabi is 
the, the greatest way of honoring the Prophet وسلم, by addressing him by this, this title, this status of uh, being a, a messenger, being someone who's been given revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the Prophet وسلم, here to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What happened or what's going on in this background that is that the Prophet ﷺ is being told to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some of the scholars, they mention, they say that this is a response to, um, this is a response to some of the, what's basically some of the offers of the, the, the disbelievers to try to, to get the Prophet ﷺ to compromise, right? So some of like the Jews of, uh, of Medina, some of the people of Thaqif, like some of these tribes, some of the mushrikeen in general, are trying to get the Prophet ﷺ to compromise on some of the uh, theological, you know, uh, beliefs or some of the stances of the Muslims. So there's this tanazul aqadi that's trying to that they're trying to 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 have to to kind of you know uh, have here where they're trying to get the Prophet to 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 compromise and so they said in some of the they said this is a response to that it's Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reminding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam have taqwa of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and don't obey or don't uh, you know follow. Don't compromise with these people who are trying to. Sorry, one second. Excuse me. Okay. No problem. Sorry about that. So, so some. This is what uh, some of the the mufassirin say is the sabab, is the reason for this for this ayah. However, uh, some of the other ones they respond and they say no. This is actually baid jidda. This is this is actually very far away from the reality. This is very far away from the reality that there's nothing really that clearly indicates that this is the sabab. And this wouldn't, uh, this doesn't seem like it would be the, the, the reason for it. Maybe because they said, you know, the Prophet ﷺ would never obviously compromise or anything like that. And so he said, there, this is not uh, the reason for it. But they said that the actual reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of this surah is telling the Prophet ﷺ to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to show all of us, show all of the believers that no one is above being reminded or above the concept of taqwa. Even the Prophet wasallam, who is a messenger of Allah, who is the most beloved to Allah, who has the highest status position with Allah, even the Prophet wasallam, is not above having taqwa, or not above being reminded about taqwa. And so they said there's no specific sabab, but it's to drive home this point. And if the Prophet wasallam, his relationship with Allah is a relationship that's built on taqwa, what about everyone else? Everyone else, definitely that's the case as well. Okay? Um, yes, so this is what they, they, they say. This is where this reminder or, or the reason that this, uh, that this surah is starting with, with this, with this ayah. And it means here, uh, you know, to the Prophet wasallam, it doesn't mean start having taqwa. It's obviously... The Prophet ﷺ, by him, you know, we know who, who, he is uh, لله, as he tells us, so that we take him as an example that I have the most taqwa of anyone of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the command here is continue to have taqwa. Continue to have taqwa. Hold on to this taqwa. Live with this taqwa. Continue with it. Okay? Um, and this is this reminds us, you know, this is a reminder to whoever 
thinks that a command or an address or a uh, uh, you know uh, a directive from Allah subhanahu wa taala doesn't apply to 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 them. If it applies to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it applies to to us all. Okay. Uh, and 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 here specifically, like one of the mashayikh he mentioned, what's the taqwa here? It's it's uh, or what's the goal of that taqwa? What's what's what is it aiming towards? Tahsil al thawab and al amal min al aqab, trying to get the reward and trying to protect oneself from from punishments, right? Trying to get a reward and trying to protect oneself from punishment through through being aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a- acting in a way that's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, staying away from that, which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says, وَلَا تُطِعِ الْكَافِرِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقِينَ Don't obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Why? Because these are people who are going to try to get you off of that. These are people who are, who are going to try to turn you away from taqwa. Okay? And so Allah is giving us, you know, the, the way towards, towards taqwa, is you know and reminding us or he's saying ittaqillah this is what, the command and then the the path wala tuti'il kafirin munafiqin don't obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites they're trying to take you off of the path of taqwa inna allaha kana aliman hakima allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing and all wise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is uh you know he knows who has taqwa he knows what the path of taqwa is he knows what the disbelievers and the hypocrites are trying to do, right? And he is all wise. Yani everything that he does is based off of a wisdom, subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَاتَّبِعْ مَا يُوحَى إِلَيْكَ Continuing to give, what's that, what's that path of taqwa? To follow that which has been revealed to you, مِنْ رَبِّكَ From your Rabb. Because he knows, again, what's best for you and what's going to allow you to reach that level of taqwa. Inna Allah kana bima ta'maluna khabira. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of all that, of all that we do. Okay, so he's giving that path to victory. It's following revelation, following the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And based off of this, and this is a point of usul, uh, usul al fiqh, the scholars, they said, this ayah shows us that there's no ijtihad. There's no juristic or, you know, uh, there's no like de- juristic deduction or reasoning. Ma'annas. If you have clear evidence. Right? So if, if there is a revelation, Quran, Sunnah, that clearly tells you, that clearly gives a, uh, a command or a prohibition, no one can come and say, well, I think, you know, through ijtihad, that this is what it should be, or that this is what it should be. لا اجتهاد مع النص. There's no اجتهاد with a clear, unequivocal revelation or clear, unequivocal uh, directive from Allah subhanahu wa taala through the Quran or through the Sunnah. And then Allah subhanahu wa taala says, وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا. This process of uh, you know following revelation and, and 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 building taqwa and not obeying those who are trying to take you off of that it requires a level of tawakkul it requires a level of uh comfort a level of reassurance a level of um you know being guided to this and just and and, and being steadfast in this so trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough as al wakil as the one, as the ultimate trustee, as the one that we rely on, the one that we depend on here, right? And this concept of tawakkul, we're going to see throughout this surah, especially in uh, the the story or the ayat that talk about the battle of al-Ahzab. And so here, it's uh, sakina being given to the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam by Allah subhanahu wa taala, reminding him and reminding us of where uh, you know who's. Uh, in control and, and on who best to rely on and on who we who we depend on on who we depend on right so it's a very beautiful beginning of of this of these these few first few ayat in this surah here then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says I'll just leave this up and then for those to see then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ 
So first Allah, he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has not placed two hearts within any man's chest, within any man's chest. What is this referring to? So it's interesting. You'll find uh, when one of the mashayikh was explaining this, this, to, this to us, he said, you know, uh, that when he was explaining it, he said that, th that for some reason that some of the mufassideen, they went into great depth trying to see who is this man? Who is, like, is this referring to a specific man? And who is this man? And the reason for this is because uh, there's some, uh, you know, basically indications or narrations that say that Quraysh, that there was a man in the time, uh, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they would say that this man, yeah, he is, so intelligent and has so much knowledge and has memorized so much like he has two hearts like he has two hearts and he's more intelligent he has more knowledge more intelligence than the prophet and so they said they it refers to this right and and so they tried to say who is this man and they gave names and these uh, a name and these kind of things but but uh, you know uh, our our sheikh mentioned like this is also baid and the Quran wouldn't come with something like this or reveal about something like this in which there's no, uh, what he said, like no really like tangible benefit to, to this here. It, Allah leaves this. This is something that is, it seems uh, more, uh, it's, it's, it's talking in a more general sense. It's not referring to like a specific person or even if this person is like, even if this is true that there was a person who had this level of intelligence, that it's not referring to anyone like this. But it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivering a, a very powerful point actually here, right? And so any discussion about who this is or if this is referring to someone specific is really kind of a moot point, it seems. But the, what's important here is uh, the message that's being delivered, okay? Which is that. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't placed in any person two hearts. Okay, and this is obviously not referring necessarily, like the primary meaning I should say is not referring to on a physical level. But what this, as some of the mashayikh they mentioned, some of the mufassirin they talk about, is that this is preparation for what's going to come after. So Allah is going to mention some things that are, that are going to come after to be able to prepare the listener and the reader for, for, for these things, Allah is mentioning this fact and this reality here, which is that in a heart that you can't have two opposing things. You can't have belief and disbelief, two things that are contradictory, I should say. You can't have belief and, and disbelief in one heart. You can't have someone that believes and that rejects at the same time. You can't have... Uh, an acceptance and a rejectance and a rejection of Islam at the same time. Okay, so you can't have uh, things that are uh, opposites in the heart at the same time of of iman and disbelief. And this is something that will be agreed upon. And so Allah is mentioning something yani, that is agreed upon to address. Something that needs to be corrected that's within this jahili, uh, that's, with, that's within the pre-Islamic uh, Arab society and that may have seeped into uh, the, the culture of that time by mentioning what is agreed upon first. What is agreed upon first? And by mentioning a, a reality and a truth that there cannot be, you know, a person can't have uh, two hearts at the same time can't be a believer and a disbeliever at the same time, for example, right? And even, you know, subhanAllah, this is an example here of the precision of the Qur'an, uh, of the precision of the Qur'an and its wordings, okay? Because even though this is referring on a spiritual level primarily, right, uh, this idea of, of you know, uh, these these things that are opposites not occurring at the same time or not occurring in the same in the same you know, the same context, but uh, just the precision of it can also extend to a physical sense, right? Because uh, the scholars, they, they say that 
you have um, you can't have I'll address these inshallah so the, the, the scholars they say well Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically uses the word ma ja'ala Allahu li rajulin min qalbayni fi jawfi exactly Zakallah khair, Dr. Wahid. That even on a, on a physical level, the fact that Allah says He uses specifically uses the word rajul. That way, if, because if Allah had used a more general word, right, li li ahadin, if He had said for anyone, for example, then a person could come and say, well, uh, when a woman is pregnant, she technically has two hearts in her body. She technically has two hearts in her body. Good, Sister Iram also mentioned it. And so the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala specifies the word rajul eliminates that potential argument against the Qur'an as well. Right? To say, oh, no, well, even though, again, remember, it's, it's talking about it in a spiritual sense, but even from that physical sense, it's accurate and it's precise. Right? That, uh, that no one can come and say, well, a woman, when she's pregnant, she has two hearts inside of her. So Allah, specifically, the word here is, is rajul. Is rajul. مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِ Okay, and so this is uh, the, the subhanAllah, the accuracy, the precision of the Qur'an. So then what's this a tawti'a for? What's this a preparation for? What comes after? Which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَمَا جَعَلَ أَزْوَاجَكُمُ اللَّائِي تُظَاهِرُونَ مِنْهُنَّ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ Before I come to that, I'll answer uh, these specific questions. What is the difference between ta'a and ittiba'a? As Allah uses ta'a against disbelievers and hypocrites and ittiba' for revelation. Ittiba' for revelation. So ta'a means obedience. Ittiba' means to follow. Ta'a means obedience. right? Ittiba' means to follow. So they have two different uh, connotations and two different contexts. Two different contexts. So... Uh, the, the general word or, or just obedience is ta'a, whereas ittiba means yeah, you're actually following. You're actually following. So there's, there's, a, there's a difference there. There's a difference there. And why ta'a for the disbelievers and ittiba for, for the wahi? Allah knows best. Allah knows best. You can reflect over that and let us know, inshallah. Or you can't have two masters. That could, that could, that could be true. That could be true as well. That you can't have. To, to master. Yes, that could work as well. I mean, the heart can't be a master. It can't be a, a, in servitude to two masters. Jameen, very good, very good. And some, uh, you know, some will use this to, to, you know, and quote this like when they say, you know, uh, when someone is not paying attention, you know, or a person is like, in you can't basically give your full attention to two separate things right because you have that focus of the heart on one thing you won't be able to to be able to to to, to fully comprehend or, or focus on two things right so it can be uh you know this 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 phrase here is a very beautiful phrase that has a lot of depth to it has a lot of depth to it okay so in the context here of this verse like we said it's kind of mentioning something that's agreed upon to be able to address something that is uh that that needs to be corrected here, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Wama Jala Azwajakum, he didn't make your wives, Allah Itubahiruna minhun, that you do lihar on or with Ummahatikum, your mothers. So this requires context. This requires okay, what is lihar? What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning here? Okay, there was a uh, a very ugly practice of the uh, the the Arab at, of some of the Arab at that time called vihar, called vihar. Okay, uh, which is that a person would say to their wife, uh, a man would say to his wife, "Anti alayya ka zahri ummi," that you are to me like the back of my mother. Lihar, from Lahar. So, uh, from like Lahar, which means back. Like you are to me, like the back of, like the back of my mother. What, what, what was the purpose of this? This is basically how they would. Uh, one of the ways that they would divorce, and yani to make 
just like my mother is haram on me, I'm making you like, I'm making you like my mother. And I'm, 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 uh, I, I'm, you're to me like my mother. So just like obviously, you know, uh, the, the greatest of uh, maharim to a person is their mother, right? So to, to make one's wife like that would make basically them saying that you are divorced. It was, it's a way to divorce, to divorce, uh, for a person to divorce their wife. And it was a tahrim ala ta'beet. Okay, tahrim ala ta'beet, forever, that's it. It's just like irrevocable uh, divorce. Okay? Uh, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is correcting this mistake that's entrenched in society. And he's saying that these uh, women that you make, that you say to them, uh, you are to me like, the, the back of my mother, that they are nothing like your mother. And so Allah is basically doing ibtal. He's completely negating and completely removing this, uh, this approach or this uh, practice. And here, again, so what's the connection between ma ja'alallahu li rajul min qalbayni fi jawfi? Showing that these two opposite things, that they cannot uh, exist together okay so a person a, a woman to the to the same person cannot be a mother and wife at the same time right one is the most haram thing on them and one is the most halal thing on them the person's mother is awlal muharramat hurrimat alaykum ummahatukum right hurrimat alaykum ummahatukum the first of those who are mentioned as haram on a person is, is their mother, is their mother, right? And the most halal thing for a person, right, in terms of what they're allowed to do and these kind of things, the most halal, you know, it's everything of, for them is halal, is, is the wife. So these two contradictory things can't come together. So how can you do lihar? How can you make and say to, to your wife, that you are to me like the back of my mother, and you're to me like my mother. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is negating these two things and showing that ma ja'alallahu li rajulun min qalbayn, that these two opposing contradictory things, that they, they cannot go together. And so it's using almost like a, uh, in a way, a logical approach to, to, to show them how, uh, how wrong and how uh, false this practice of of lihar is and, and Allah negating this practice and removing it as a, a as having any impact or any effect okay and so it's if a person said this to their wife a person would say this to their wife in those times it would be considered a like irrevocable divorce Allah removed that so if a person says it after these revelations have come down or Allah is prohibiting it right that that, that there would be, it, it wouldn't count as a divorce. And this is not something, if a person said to their wife, Anti ummi, that you are to me like the back of my mother, it wouldn't be a divorce, unless they intended divorce by it. But just as, as wording, it, it's, it's being negated as having any sort of uh, impact or consequence, right? Uh, but there is, obviously, you may say, okay, well, what about in Surah Al-Mujadala? where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions like there's kafara for saying it. Yes, there is kafara on it. There's expiation if a person does this, right? Uh, of freeing a slave and uh, if they know slave then, that, or they can't free a slave, then feeding, uh, you know, then fasting two months, feeding the poor, these things that are there as an expiation. But that's ta'diba. This is as a way to, um, it's like a punishment, basically. It's a kafara that needs to be paid as a consequence of saying this thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown to be a uh, uh, something that needs to be negated and removed completely from completely from society so you see the connection there so and you can even you can go back right so what the people of uh, of Ishraq and Nifaq what are they going to say Allah is saying don't obey them don't follow them what are they going to say Allah is telling us what they're going to say and Allah prepares uh, 
the believers for what's going to come after. And then he negates and he destroys, he removes this, uh, this ada, this cultural norm that was there amongst some of the people, this urf that was there, that had spread in the society that needed to be corrected and reformed. Okay? There's some, there's some question. To reflect more of that, Kufar and Iman can be together. Same that Prophet also mentioned a believer commits a murder, zina, and drink alcohol. A man goes out from his heart at that moment. He's actually sinning. Jameel. Very good. Zakhlaf. Very good reflection, mashallah. The concept of the heart is also discussed in Surah Mujadala and revealing the punishment of this sin. Practice. Jameel. In Surah Mujadala, uh, because there was a specific incident with one of the companions who had uh, basically made lihar, you know, to his wife. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and she comes, uh, you know, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reveals verses defending uh, this this female companion, radiallahu anha, and giving and showing, you know, how this practice of lihar is something that is negated. It's something that should be uh you know, completely removed, completely removed. Does this make sense? Does you understand the connection here between uh, the first part of the verse and then this, so, uh, speaking about lihar? See where it connects there? And does, that, does, does what I mentioned about lihar make sense as well? Any questions? If it doesn't make sense or if there's something that needs to be clarified, please let me know, inshallah. Okay, if we have, uh, we can, should we keep going? Okay, let's keep going, inshallah. Then Allah says, and this is another another uh, example of this, okay, that comes as well of this first part of the verse. Allah says, وَمَا جَعَلَ أَدْعِيَاءَكُمْ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ ذَلِكُمْ قَوْلُكُمْ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also he didn't make your ad'iya, your adopted sons, your own sons. And this is another example of two things that can't go together. Meaning a person can't be uh, can't be the son of two people at the same time. Okay? And a person can't have two fathers at the same time. Two people who are laying claim that this is the person, for example, Fulan Ibn, two different people. Okay? Uh, someone named Abdullah, not anyone actual. Abdullah is the son of, he can only be the son of one person, right? Whether it's Abdullah ibn Zayd or Abdullah ibn Amr. It has to be one of the two. It can't be, can't be Abdullah ibn Zayd and Abdullah ibn Amr. So Allah is negating, again, these two things that can't come together, that can't uh, exist together at the same time. And he's doing this, again, to negate and to logically show them by starting with something that they agreed upon. No person can have two hearts at the same time, right? Uh, that's something that's agreed upon. And then to remove this cultural practice as well of what's called a tabanni, this adoption, okay? And and uh, so what is it exactly? So the word ad'iya is the plural of da'i. Da'i is man yunsab ila ghayri abihi. Whoever is attributed or given uh, their uh, their nasab to someone other than, their nasab is given to someone other than their father. Someone other than their father. Uh, and this is something that was, that, that was practiced at that time. That was practiced at that time. That a person would, uh, you know, adopt for whatever benefit or for whatever reason. Sometimes it was a worldly benefit. Sometimes it was out of love, right? And then that person would become the actual son of that person. And this actually happened, and this was a, a you know, a, a, a cultural practice at that time that was acceptable, that was uh, the norm, even uh, 
with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is also here, we're getting a uh, an indication of something that's going to happen later on in the story as well. One of the main parts of this story, which is uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's marriage to Zainab radiallahu anha, who was before the wife of, uh, of Zayd ibn Haritha, who was the adopted son of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so there's certain, again, cultural norms, cultural practices that need to be corrected here, understandings that need to be corrected. Uh, and we, we're going to talk about, at length about this, inshallah, right? But uh, Zayd radiallahu an was someone that was very, uh, very beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And we know that Zayd was... Uh, you know, he was someone who kind of got separated from his family. And he was very beloved to his family, his father, Haritha, and, and his tribe. And he got separated from them and was actually sold into slavery. And so he was bought by uh, the cousin of Khadija, radiallahu anha, a man by the name of uh, Hakim ibn Hizam. You may have heard that name before. And so, so, uh, so Khadija had Zayd and Khadija gave uh, Zayd as a gift to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam freed Zayd and he uh, had a very very close relationship with him Alayhi Salatu Wasallam and uh, when Zayd when his family had heard that you know they were looking for him this whole time and they heard that he's in Mecca and they went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said you know we'll give you we'll pay you for for, for him to give us back to him uh, to give him back to us, sorry. And and the Prophet ﷺ said, you know what, I'll do you one better, basically, that I won't charge you, like they won't, you won't, I won't make you pay to take him, but let him choose. If he wants to go with you, then he, he, then he goes with you, no problem. He's your son. But if he wants to stay with me, then I'm not going to force him, you know, against his wishes. And so the, his father and his uncle, they said, of course, course what a generous offer what a beautiful offer uh that the prophet because they, they thought there's no way he's going to choose his own I mean, he, of course he's going to choose his own father his own family to go back to live in honor instead of living as like a servant or whatever they thought he was living as right and so he goes uh they they, they bring him and they basically tell him you know, you have the option, you have the choice, who you want to stay with. And he actually chooses the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'm sure, of course, his, his family is shocked. But when they see that, you know, that he is being taken care of and he's being treated well and he's says he's happy with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they accept that and they're okay with that. And from that point, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took uh, Zayd and, and he said, uh, he is my son. And he, that this is This is my son. He inherits me and I inherit him. Okay. And so even before uh, prophethood, uh, that you see that this, this close relationship that they had. And this was before prophet. So he said, he, he's my son. He inherits me and I inherit him. And this concept of inheritance is like the greatest form of, of showing uh, that closeness. Like he's going to inherit from me if something happens to me. Right? That's, he's the, uh, close like, like blood. Okay, and that's why Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, we, 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 used to, we, we didn't call Zayd anything except Zayd ibn Muhammad. We didn't, we, we didn't used to even call him Zayd ibn Hadid. We used to call him Zayd ibn Muhammad. But after these ayahs were revealed, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, you are your Zayd ibn Haritha. Right? It doesn't remove that closeness that they had, right? But it's giving every haq back to the one that that haq goes back to. So Zayd, as close as he is with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like a son, like blood, still, uh, when he is being referred to or being, uh, you know, the, his lineage, it goes back to, to who actually his father is. And so from that moment on, he was known as Zayd Ibn, Zayd Ibn Haritha. And so it's showing us, again, this thing that a person can't be the son to two different people. It goes back to that be the beginning part. Of, of this of this ayah, right? But, uh, and, and this is something that then is emphasized heavily, that a person, they uh, attribute themselves 
to, to, to their actual lineage and to who they actually are. And, and, and in the context of a society like this that bases so much on lineage and, and, uh, and the importance that it gives, this is an important thing. It's an important thing that makes sure that it's, it's giving each thing, each person, each family their haq. This is this person's son, and they're referred to as, as their son, right? And, and there's even a lot of uh, heavy emphasis on um, for a per and he, there's a, a strong wording from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the person who uh, attributes themselves to other than their father, right? So my name, for example, you know, is, is Umar, and my father is is, is Nasir. May Allah subhanahu wa taala have mercy on him. That for me to attribute myself and say, you know, I'm the son of someone else, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam actually called this, or for someone to do that to someone else. Oh no, there's not the son of this, they're the son of this person. The Prophet also actually called this kufr. So this is a form of kufr. Right? And it's not kufr of disbelief here. It's kufr duna kufr. And it's 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 an action that's so severe that it's given the name of kufr, but it doesn't make a person a disbeliever, but it shows that it's a heavy sin. It shows that it's a heavy sin here. Okay? And so this is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا جَعَلَ أَدْعِيَاءَكُمْ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ We didn't make those who are your uh, adopted sons as your actual sons. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَلِكُ ذَلِكُمْ قَوْلُكُمْ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ What is the ذَلِكُمْ referencing back to? It's referencing back to these two statements or these two things that they would do, that the Arabs before would do, which is dihar. Right, making your your wife like your mother, and uh, and and uh, claiming uh, a different lineage or or making your adopted sons like your sons. This is the statement by your mouths, and the fact that Allah says afwa, that this is your statement by uh, your afwa. That it shows by when Allah is saying that it's the mouths, that it shows لا يلامس الواقع ولا يطابق الحقيقة وليس له حكم شرعي. Right? Allah is when He says that it's from the mouth, that this indicates that this doesn't show the reality, right? And that it's not consistent with truth, and that it has it carries no legal or no legislative weight. It's just statements of of the mouth. It's not something that has depth. It's not something that has legitimacy to it. Wallahu yaqulu al-haqq wa huwa yahdi al-sabeel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the truth and he guides to the correct and he guides to the correct path. He guides to the correct path. He guides to that. So when Allah says this, wallahu yaqulu al-haqq, Allah says the truth and he guides to the correct path, it's preparing for what's to come, which is what it actually is, what these things actually should be and what they actually are. Allah is going to tell us. So Allah is removing yahdim wa yabni though. Right? So he, he, he kind of, he breaks this belief down. He breaks this cultural practice. He removes this cultural norm. But he replaces it. Or he gives the correct understanding or the correct path or the correct way. Right? So it's not just uh, something being destroyed. But there's something that's being built. And this is important. We don't just destroy. But... You know, you don't just say, oh, this is wrong and what you're doing is wrong and what you're doing is wrong. And then you just leave a person like that, right? Now, it's important in general that when we break down, if we remove something, we replace it with something else, right? And this is what Allah is doing here, Azza wa Jal. Wallahu yaqulu al-haqq wa huwa yati. Allah speaks the truth and tells us the truth. And he guides to that which is the best, uh, the, 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 the path. In a straight path, and then he's going to tell us. So, how then do we deal with our uh, the the adopted sons, the ones that a person is taking care of, one that a person is looking after? How do the, how are they supposed to be referred? How are they supposed to be addressed? How are they supposed to be dealt with? And that comes in the next ayah, which inshallah we will start from uh, next week. Inshallah, Taala Monday. Alhamdulillah, I got through. Uh, the ayat that I wanted to get through today. And inshallah, from next week, we will start with verse ayah 5. Ayah 5. Any questions 
as we are wrapping up, inshallah. Any questions as we're wrapping up? So one heart could not have ta'atullah wa ta'a. Disbelievers with the wife cannot be a mother. Jimmy, she'll either be a wife or a mother. She'll either be a wife or a mother. She can't be both. She can't be both. I'm going to make a joke, but I'll not make the joke then. So, I was going to say sometimes the wife is the mother. But, you know, as long as there's no... There shouldn't be the hawk still, of course. Sometimes the wife takes both of those roles. <laughs> Some people would like that. <laughs> so if a mu'min uh, or a Muslim adopts from an adoption center, what last name should they give the child? So that's that's one of the that's a contemporary issue. Uh, so I'm not sure about the last name. I'm not sure about the last name, but what should definitely not happen is that if a person adopts and they adopt someone, especially at a young age where they kind of grow up in the household and these things and see themselves as a, uh, you know, as a member of the family, which is, again, we're, we'll talk a little bit about that inshallah next week. And this is, this ayah is not like negating this concept of taking care of those like orphans and those who need to be taken care of, or, you know, uh, these practices that have a lot of benefit that can have a lot of benefits to them in terms of adoption with the conditions and stuff. But it's, it's making sure that that person doesn't lose uh, sight or lose knowledge of where they came from, who they are, right? Who, who, uh, you know, they're, they're like, basically you don't adopt someone and erase their, their history or their family or tell them, no, no, you're actually my son, right? Yeah, you're my son, or my daughter, but you're not, right? But you, so, I mean, they are in terms of the love, in terms of the care, in terms of the attention, but to not make them your actual son. I can say, no, no, I, like, I birthed you, <laughs> right? Or you came, like, you are from, you know, blood. And then it's not, you know, you tell them, yeah, you're not my son, you're not important. Obviously, not that, right? But not erasing their own lineage, not erasing their their lineage from them and, you know, making sure that they know, you know, so that they're aware of that and that it's not, it doesn't become like, you know, that they lose uh, any sight of who they were or, or the fact that, you know, that they had uh, different parents and these kind of things, okay? But uh, in terms of the last name, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Allah knows best. Allah knows. That's a good question to ask, ask Sheikh for Islam. I'm not sure. Hey, wife. I'm not going to read that comment. <laughs> not on the air, at least. Uh, any other questions before we end? Any other questions before we end? And here, this is important. And he gives each... Right. Each person has their um, each person has their rights, you know. If, if this is your child and this is someone that you know you gave birth to and uh, they, they're from you, right? It's not it's not it's you know that they have the rights of that 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 connection. They have the right of that you know of being attributed back to them. For someone else to take that and say, "Oh no, this is erase that from them." That's that's a form of it can be a, that could be a form of one. One knows best. Okay, I think then we are done. Alhamdulillah, with week two, Walillah alhamd, halfway through, uh, halfway through our Ramadan tafasir. Inshallah, we'll see. I think we'll, we'll be able to finish this surah by in, in two weeks, inshallah. But Zakmullah uh, khair. Enjoy your weekend. No tafsir until Monday. Inshallah, we will reconvene then. Zakmullah khair. Like a wife being halal in marriage, a child you raise who is not your child is connected to laws of marriage.
So there's, yes, so the laws of marriage, that's exactly what this surah is going to be addressing, that if a person is just has that, that connection as like an adopted son, that they don't have that same, uh, those same restrictions when it comes to, when it comes to marriage, unless there is uh, the rada'a that's done. There's the rada'a that's done, uh, that, you know, the, the breastfeeding of the, of the small child, you know, of the baby, that makes that child that gives that child the, the, the position of the son. That gives that child the position of, uh, of the son. And so the same things, that w the same people that would be haram. So for example, if someone adopts and the child is uh, an infant and so the mother breastfeeds, so then all of the siblings become like the siblings, right? And they're not allowed to marry those siblings. If that doesn't happen, then no, that it's, there's no blood relation there. There's no rada relation. Then it, it's still halal, okay? Uh, stepfather is different. Stepfather is different. Stepfather is mentioned in the ayah as as hurma. So if uh, as if if a woman has children, okay, and then she her husband she divorces or her husband she gets divorced from her husband or her husband passes away and she remarries. If she if that if that that remarriage happens and and it's a full marriage, then uh, the stepfather is mahram to her children. So there, there, there's no marriage there, and vice versa as well. Meaning, if a fa if a man has uh, a wife, okay, uh, a man has children, and then later on he has another wife, like something happens, he has another wife. That wife, that second wife, who's the stepmother of his children, his his blood children, they are also mahram to their stepmother. There's mahram to their stepmother, and this is and Allah mentions this in. In Surah An Nisa, when he talks about who's, uh, you know, the, the, the relationships, the maharim, the mahram. So there's three ways of mahram. There's way a mahram can be through blood, can be through um, marriage, and can be through rada. Ah. And then there and there's specific rules that relate to this as well, inshallah. So, yeah, I want to adjust that. Zakmullah khair. We'll end with that. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum.